John pulled up his rucksack. He looked around him, surrounded by thousands of people. He was so excited he was part of something so big, something special. They were going to change the lives of the struggling workers of Manchester, possibly even the country. But just then, screams rang out and cries of soldiers as the cavalry came thundering closer. After the Napoleonic Wars, England had been hit hard financially and suffered economic hardship in the years immediately following and Lord Liverpool's government faced growing demands for social, political and economic reform. In the textile towns of the powerhouse that was the industrial north, wages plummeted, as factory systems developed with new technologies, replacing handcrafts in favour of mass production, and the traditional handloom weavers were among the worst affected. In 1815, laws were passed known as the Corn Laws, that were intended to protect British agricultural landowners from cheap foreign imports, but their effect was to increase the grain prices and decrease supplies, causing greater hardship among the already destitute poor. In 1816, also known as the year without summer, severe weather resulted in very poor harvest, leading to further food shortages during the winter of 1816 all the way through to 1817. This discontent led to riots, First it was small gatherings in some county districts and then larger meetings in towns and cities, notably the London Spa Field Riots that ran across November and December in 1816. A reform bill of universal suffrage was drafted with considerable input from what was labelled the Northern Radicals and presented to Parliament at the end of January by Thomas Cochrane. But like other bills that would follow for basic pay, holidays, basic rights, they were constantly rejected and voted against by the Tory party. This made matters worse, as the poor of the country really were suffering and had been left with no other option. Things escalated on the 28th of January 1817, when the Prince Regent's coach was attacked on the way back from Parliament. The government responded with the so-called gag acts, which were one of a number of measures used to repress the so-called radicals which also included the suspension of the Habeas Corpus Act, which was an act that secured the liberty of an individual, which prevented unlawful or arbitrary imprisonment. This was added to the laws passed in the late 1700s banning gatherings of more than 50 people, the Sedacious Meetings Act, and the Combinations Act that outlawed unions and gatherings of workers. The rejection of the draft bill and the increasingly repressive measures of the corruption from the government led to a series of escalating events across the country, but particularly in Manchester, that in the words of the government, was a hotbed for free thinkers and radicals, as this was a time when men and women could not vote. There was no weekends, no sick pay, holiday pay, maternity, benefits, you worked or begged, and if you suffered, so be it. It was the country that was controlled by Parliament, and this was made up of a very small number of very wealthy landowning men, with only two parties, the Tories and the Whigs. But at this time, they were also nervous, as the French Revolution had just happened, completely changing the political and ruling face of France, and democracy was not something the government was going to tolerate on British soil. In January and February 1817, John Lees started hearing hush whispers at work, at first, he kept his head down and ignored the groups of men that would stand together excitedly talking amongst themselves. John had decided not to force his way into whatever was going on, as he was new and hadn't worked there long. He was an ex-soldier who had returned home and hung up his rifle after the Napoleonic Wars and the Battle of Waterloo. It had left his mark on not just his body, but his mind too. John was average height, stocky, brown haired and brown eyes and a worn face that was scarred from powder burns from his rifle. One day, curiosity though got the better of him, and he stood at the back of a group of various workers and deputies, listening to what was going on. There was to be meetings in Manchester, 
and they were going to be addressed by radical auditors, Samuel Drummond and John Bagley. Drummond and Bagley had planned a march to London to present a petition to the Crown, the Prince Regent, demanding that the government do something to help the struggling trade and the poor. John heard that more meetings had been planned to encourage others to join the demonstration that was planned on the 10th of March. These plans were announced by William Benbow at a public meeting in Manchester on the 3rd of March, at which the hope was expressed that the marches would be at least 20,000 strong and 100,000 strong by the time they reached London. It was estimated there was going to be 20,000 people marching to London. However, things did not go as planned. Some of the Lancashire reformers opposed the march and advised their supporters not to take part for fear of repercussions. Samuel Bamford, a weaver, writer and a radical leader from Middleton, had thought the march ill-planned and unwise. He called to the crowd that if they went on this march, the government would denounce them as robbers and rebels and the military would be brought out to cut them down or take them prisoner. He also expressed his relief that no Middleton people went on the marches. Worse still, one of the organisers disappeared with the money that had been raised to feed the blanketeers, leaving them without means or support for the march. On the 10th of March 1817, John made his way across Manchester to St Peter's Field with his sack thrown over his shoulder. As he got closer, it got harder and harder to move through the cobbled streets. They were full of people. Even though it was raining, 5,000 marchers, mainly spinners and weavers, stood together in the grassy waste ground. A large crowd of 25,000 onlookers, cheering and waving, stood around. The crowd buzzed with excitement. Each marcher had a blanket or rolled overcoat on his back. This was to sleep under at night and it also served as a sign that the man was a textile worker. This would also give the march its eventual nickname. The march to London had been planned out. The marchers were to walk in separate groups of ten to avoid any accusation of illegal mass assembly and avoid imprisonment or harm. Each group of ten would also carry a petition bearing twenty names appealing directly to the Prince Regent to take urgent steps to improve the Lancashire cotton trade. Before the marchers left, the organisers stressed at the importance of the lawful behaviour during the march, with Drummond declaring, We will let them see it is not riot or disturbance we want, it is bread we want, and we will apply to our noble prince as a child would to its father for bread. The first of the marchers started to leave, waving to the cheering crowd. John fell in with them, enjoying the feeling of familiarity from his past life of soldiering. They had been walking for around 40 minutes when the mood changed. News was reaching John and the others. Of the 5,000 blanketeers, there were now several hundred of them. The magistrates had arrived at the meeting and had read the riot act, and then the meeting had been broke up by the King's Dragoon Guards. A good number was injured due to the sheer amount of people trying to leave, and 27 people had been arrested, including Bagley and Drummond and the word was the cavalry were now pursuing them. With this news, some of the marchers fled, but many others carried on, with some being attacked in Ardwick on the outskirts of Manchester. John reached Stockport. He was walking with the nine others of his group towards the back of the marchers, when there was a rumbling sound that John knew all too well. Cries of cavalry went out, and he saw them charging, sabres already drawn. All around him, people were running. Some even dropped their belongings so they could run faster. Right near John, one local resident was shot and fell to the ground dead. The cavalry ploughed into them using their horses to knock people everywhere. Many dropped out of the march and fled, and over 200 were rounded up and arrested, including John. Many were injured and several marchers had sabre wounds. The majority were turned back or arrested under the vagrancy laws before they had even reached Derbyshire, with some only getting as far as Macclesfield. However, there were unconfirmed stories that just one marcher named Abel Coldwell continued, convinced if he could just reach London and hand over the petition everything would get better. 
Day and night he marched, but on reaching London, he handed over the petition and it was ignored. Some concerns were expressed over the harsh suppression of the march, bearing in mind the marchers had done nothing wrong and technically they hadn't broken any laws. But the Manchester magistrates quickly provided justification for the authorities' actions. On the 28th of March, a private meeting of reformers was broken up in the Ardwick Bridge area of Manchester. And the following day, it was announced that a major conspiracy had been discovered. According to the official story, deputies in Manchester and other northern towns had been planning an uprising, in which the army and local officials would be attacked, mills would be burnt, and the imprisoned blanketeers would be liberated. It was said that up to 50,000 people were expected to take part, and many suspected insurrectionists were arrested immediately, including Samuel Bamford, whose memoirs contained a detailed description of his arrest and detention. The prisoners were taken to London in irons for personal interrogation, otherwise known as torture, by a secret tribunal, including the Foreign Secretary and the Home Secretary. In some cases, they were held without a trial for months before their eventual release. No sign of the uprising was seen on the appointed day, and there was no evidence whatsoever found that any of the conspiracy was true. But the event was used to support the government's case for the continued emergency measures. Parliament renewed the suspension of the Habeas Corpus Act again, and it was not reinstated until the following March at which time legislation indemnifying officials for any unlawful actions during the period of suspension was also passed. Meanwhile, the Pentridge Rising in Derbyshire in June 1817 continued the trend of insurrection amongst the working class of the same social and political reform. The government also clamped down on the press, banning any radical writing, and had passed a power of imprisonment bill in February 1817. The Blanketeers' March and the subsequent false conspiracy alarms led the Manchester magistrates to form the short-lived Manchester and Salford Yeomanry Cavalry, intended to combat any future attempts of insurrection. It became infamous two years later, after its role in the Peterloo Massacre. To finish with, as a quote from Mr Poole, the sole purpose of the Blanketeers' March was to appeal in the last resort to the Crown over the head of Parliament, and to exercise in person the right of petition, which had been denied to them by proxy. Well, that'll do it for today, but please let me know your thoughts on this story. For me personally, I can see very similar trends in what's happening in today's climate. And I'll also be covering the Peterloo Massacre in a later video. But it's the stories like the Blanketeers, Peterloo and the Suffragettes that makes me proud to be from Manchester. Also, don't forget if you're new here, please like and subscribe as it does help my channel. Thank you for your support. Take care.